So uh, thanks, folks, and thanks for uh, joining us for, uh, well, it's a freezing evening here in Hong Kong, so uh, I was about to say a warm welcome, but then that wouldn't be uh, particularly accurate. So uh, we're going to talk about political philosophy today, and I'm going to try and keep the presentation as short as is possible so we can maximise a Q&A in between sides and be a discussion afterwards. We'll run off in around 90 minutes or so, so I hope that's all right with everyone. And as usual, um, as with most things I'm involved with, I just, just keep things informal. So if you want to interject, uh, feel free to please do so via the chat uh, or via the hands raising function, which is a button apparently you can click on Zoom. I've got no clue how that works, but it's Zoom and technology, so I suppose it does work. Or you can uh, interject with your face, because like, ultimately debating is as, as much an audio activity as a visual activity. So with that said, uh, thanks all, and let's start. So, okay, for some reason, uh, this the presentation's got it off to a, a pretty rocky start. So far in that. Taylor made to the index room. Actually, what I'm going to cover today is broadly speaking four main areas and aspects. The first question I want to explore is just what exactly is political philosophy, and in the context of debating, how are we to make sense of it. Secondly, uh, when look at some theories of the state of government and also of political authority out there and how exactly do we warrant or justify a state in that sense and linking that to some debates you see in debating and otherwise. The third question is, what about rights? You know? So what, what warrants rights? What grounds rights? And how do we make arguments that compare between, way between contrast and, and juxtapose uh, rights, I suppose? And then finally, we're going to take a step back and just ask the meta and big picture question. You've got some political and philosophical claims you want to justify there. How do you do that? How do you go about in doing so? And if we have time, we'll also touch upon two uh, pet favorites or topics that I think uh, would, would benefit you all in, in terms of knowledge. The first being uh, colonial and, his and historical injustices and how do we talk about sort of colonialism, historical injustices, reparations and compensation that front. And secondly, on the political and moral status of non-human entities, animals, trees, plants, uh, what have you there. So there's a lot to get through, and I can assure you that we probably won't be able to get through all of this, I suspect. So uh, as usual, quality over quantity, right? And with that said, let's move on to the overview. So what exactly is political philosophy? I think in understanding political philosophy, we have to take a step back and try and make sense of, I suppose, um, two kinds of statements or two broad frameworks, rather, in which the world operates and our discourse about the world operates. So on one end, you have the, the is, right? So, so these are questions that we often think of or descriptions we often think of as applying to what they really is, okay? What the current world, the status quo, the objective reality constitutes. And then there's the ought on the other end, which looks at sort of what, what the world ideally should be, okay? What the world we expect to be, normatively speaking, ought to look like. And then when we talk about is ought, we, we in usual everyday language, we frame it as a juxtaposition or as a contrast. We say, okay, either something is or it ought to be, and it's different. But in, in actuality, and I think political philosophy at the core asks us not to see the world as such, to not see these two conceptual frameworks as so isolated and distinct from one another. Instead, what is and what ought to be exists on a continuum. There's certain statements and certain propositions that are exclusively dabbling in and engaging with a description of the world that is as it stands. And then the statements that are completely idealistic, they're just about what the world ought to look like, like, I don't know, the world should be as such where everyone has uh, 10 billion or, or is able to lead the lives that currently Elon Musk is living although I'm not entirely sure if that's a life worth living in, in an absolute sense, right? But both of these statements are at the radical ends of that spectrum. In practice, uh, most of the propositions we accept, use in our daily conversations probably constitute a mixture of both. So we have a bit of is, right? Where we say, for instance, uh, the president of the United States, dot, 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 we're referring not to some abstract hypothetical ought 
president of the United States, which in my case, right, the ideal case or the ideal president would probably be Hillary Clinton instead of uh, the current uh, orangutan in the office, right? Uh, sorry, Donald Trump in office. Whereas uh, if we then take a look at the statements and descriptions we add on to that, right? It might be that the president of the United States has the moral obligation to apologize for the country's abhorrent colonial history or alternatively, the president of the EU uh, ought to renounce uh, uh, its condemnatory or interfering statements over Brexit. There's a mixture of both. There's a mixture of, or a combination of a reference to what is actually the case and what ideally or normatively they should do. And that's also what debating is about. It forces us to look at a set of facts that guide us, a fact that constrain the possibilities that we have available to us and then ask yourselves, what exactly should we prefer? What's the most desirable option or the most desirable conception of the world arising out of that? And in the context of political philosophy, it's asking us, given all the descriptive constraints, the so-called is that apply to a particular political actor, which I'll explore in just a second, what ought the actor do and what ought the actor not do? So, in other words, you can see political philosophy as normative questions about practical and realistic scenarios, conundrums that confront agents. But of course, uh, if I were to say that, then you might say, Brian, isn't that just moral philosophy? That's just applied ethics, right? Well, what's the difference between that and, and just you know, political philosophy in particular? Why political philosophy? Well, of course, then, you know, the normal quick side of well, it's politically, it must involve the state right must involve the government that's what we're talking about the political as opposed to the social as opposed to the moral blah 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 and indeed 30 years 50 years ago political philosophy might have indeed uh, and you can indeed construe it as predominantly revolving around if not exclusively revolving around the ethics and also the guidelines for the structuring of the society and the state's interaction with the people and the citizenry. And indeed, you'd be excused to think that any and all sort of theorization beyond that probably belongs to the moral philosophical realm as opposed to political philosophy. But times have changed. And increasingly, I think, we've come to realize through both theorization and also empirical evidence that, that politics exists in realm more than just the state the government or the ominous nebulous entity that is uh, governance, okay? There's more to politics than that. There's also body politics, politics concerning sexual liberation, politics within the family, politics concerning, you know, whom we identify as identity politics, and ultimately power, right? The study of power and the study of politics undergirds modern society and also underpins the way we look at actors beyond the government. So even if we're just debating a motion about Twitter, you know, or Jack Dorsey's individual responsibilities, or alternatively, uh, how animals ought to be treated by a, a private company, or how we, you and I, ought to arrange uh, a debating competition, that's politics. Because that concerns the distribution of power, and it concerns the distribution of judgments of rights and wrongs, the haves and have nots under institutional framework. So I'd say that whilst political philosophy starts with a starting point concerning the state, it's expanded to include realms uh, that are increasingly diverse in terms of the agency and the element of agency involved there, such as, for instance, social media, uh, such as, for instance, private corporations that exert and wield a significant amount of influence over private citizens, or indeed, how our minds are primed and shaped by the advertisements you see on the streets that enforce particular beauty standards and ideals or we're supposed to aesthetically prefer, that's also politics at its core. So political philosophy essentially asks us to think about what should these actors, given the substantial power they have over you or over each other, over one another, how should they act? And what should we expect them to do in light of the problems that you're given? And in debating context, you know, why do you need to talk about philosophy. And in here I've inserted a, a somewhat obscure reference to uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Why is political philosophy? I hope you I hope you got that. If it's not uh, apparent, I've noticed my jokes are particularly funny. So why is political philosophy? Like, well, why do we care about political philosophy in debating? 
there are three kinds of arguments, I think, in debating that we can sort of highlight, or I suppose classify most, not all, but most claims and, and warrants and arguments, et cetera, you offer in debates uh, into. And these three categories, right, are the empirical, the interpretive, and the prescriptive. The empirical is simple, right? What's gonna happen? What will happen? What happened? What's currently going on around the world, right? Uh, you can talk about, you know, uh, the riots that happened in, on Capitol Hill, or alternatively, uh, what happened last February to March in Malaysia, okay, the succession saga, and also the collapse coalition, okay. But alternatively, uh, you can explore in your arguments, you know, in debates about, say, banning or criminalizing certain behaviors, what you think is going to happen. So fewer folks would consume what's being criminalized. For instance, uh, these these damaging, okay, and disturbing uh, texts like pornography, okay, if you criminalize pornography, fear folks that watch pornography, even though obviously I think uh, the ethics of pornography itself is a deeply controversial and contested issue, but I'm just raising an example, right, as to what an empirical claim would look like. There's also the interpretive. So after you've laid out what's going to happen or what might happen, you also need to answer the question, okay, why should I care, right? So what's the terminal impact, okay, to use more, more jargonistic parlance, so when content speakers, why bother? So what, and here, you know, you, you might in debates have to offer arguments as to why you weigh certain claims as more important than others, or why you credit certain arguments as more substantial, as more significant, as opposed to other stakeholders, as opposed to other agents in the round. Okay, and that's an evaluative process and the component of debating. And then finally, there's the prescriptive, right? Where you say, there's a principal duty on our part. There's a principal duty on a part of uh, Saudi Arabia to seize uh, interfering with uh, Yemeni affairs right now, to stop its involvement in a Yemeni civil war. There's a principal obligation on a part of NATO to compensate Horn of Africa, okay, or to compensate the descendants of victims or the, the Kosovo events, even a NATO did intervene, you know, et etc., et cetera, et cetera. These are prescriptive arguments about what should be done, and it could arguably be, as compared with interpretive arguments, more decoupled or detached from reality, but not by much, right? There's often this misconception that if you're providing arguments along of the prescriptive sort, they can be completely devoid of factual content or empirical content, right? That, oh, my argument stands because it's a principal argument, and it stands irrespective of reality. That, that, that sounds nice, okay? That sounds great and grand when uttered uh, by you know, the mouth of, of a very experienced pro-debater. But in practice, it makes little to no sense because there's always going to be an implicit empirical premise that says, this is the premise that renders this particular principle applicable to the particular motion at hand. So in other words, you know, these three kinds of arguments exist in debating and political philosophy, I'd say, applies or broadly speaking, is most pertinent when generating arguments of the second and third kinds. And I'll just flag here, by the way, that it's not about the theorists and the books when you're generating arguments along the lines of political philosophy. It's instead about how you spin these conceptual tools, how you wield these conceptual mechanisms and craft them into interpretive and prescriptive arguments, right? Arguments that both allow you to make sense of the world around you, but also in articulating what the moral imperative is or isn't in its sense. So that's the overview here. And I hope I've also offered, uh, in the process of doing so, a new conceptual framework of making sense of both political and political philosophy in context of debating, but in general as well. Any questions so far? Okay. So, Let's move on to topic number one, the state. So the two parts of this particular sort of topic I want to explore here, part one on theorizing the state and part two, I'm just trying to make sense of, I suppose, uh, where, you know, might discussions and uh, chats about the state's role and moral functions crop up in debate land. Let's start first with uh, discussing sort of the state as an entity. Now, could someone here chip in or pitch in with a definition of the state? Note, I'm not saying the states, which may refer to the states, but instead the state. 
Any thoughts on what the state is? The monopoly on the use of force in a community. Or an actor. Sorry, with, an actor with the monopoly on the use of force in a community. Mm. Interesting. Good. Yeah, that, that's fair. Uh, any other additional or uh, divergent definitions? I think you might also want to add uh, that, you know, we're looking at a fun, the, the ultimate arbitrator. So according to some conceptions or definitions of the state, it's also the arbitrator of disputes, okay? Um, not, not necessarily the sole arbitrator, but a fundamental arbitrator who possesses uh, competence, competence, so to speak, but, but that's an aside. What's more fundamental though, is a state is ultimately, as Maxwell pointed out just then, uh, an agent that wields a monopoly of violence, monopoly of force, uh, often with legitimacy, although there might also be illegitimate states. Again, we're dabbling in the is and ought sort of continuum there where there are currently states that we call states, we refer to as states, but are normatively illegitimate and therefore shouldn't be states or shouldn't be granted the powers and also recognition of there being a state. But that's a different question. Going back to, to square one, then we start with that definition. We might want to ask, okay, why should we think of this state as legitimate? And more fundamentally, legitimacy of a state is correlated with, even though it's not defined exclusively in terms of the extent to which we possess the obligation to follow the law, not the intrinsic consequences, benefits that doing so brings, because it is the state the law. Now, I don't think, you know, a moral obligation or the question of our obligation to follow the law perfectly proxies for the question of legitimacy, but it is a pretty good starting point in allowing us to sort of judge if the state at large is legitimate and vice versa, right? If a state is illegitimate, then we might still have additional and exclusive reasons to, to follow the law, but chances are these reasons aren't going to be because the state itself issued these laws and is the enforcer or, or the legislator that generated these laws. So long story short then, on the question of why should we follow the law? Now, I'm sure many of you are well versed with the term social contract. And indeed, some of you might have even read Sheng Wu's article on a social contract. What I will flag here is two things, two meta comments before going into details. The first is, I don't personally think, you know, social contract arguments are an absolute no-go. So there's not a case that just because Sheng Wu wrote an article on social contract, you know, ergo social contract is, uh, I don't know, an impermissible and dumb tool to talk about or use in debates. That's not how it works. Obviously, we can make an argument uh, in social contract theory work and stand uh, kudos to you, uh, and you can run with that, that's entirely fine. But a second comment I'll make is social contract as a term, as with many other terms in debate like backlash or, I don't know, political capital or uh, what, what, what's, the, what's the hip lingo these days? I don't know, the, the, the uh, mutual exclusivity. And a lot of these are hip terms that are abused. And by abuse, I don't just mean used by sort of novices or fresh beginners, but used by even the most experienced debaters out there repeatedly in the speeches to the point where, you know, when you say these words, many judges might just switch off and think, God, it's one of those awful arguments again. So these are two comments have nothing to do whatsoever with the substance of social contractualism, but I think is important to bear in mind. Now, let's talk about social contracts then, because there are quite a few authors and philosophers that have written on the contract, but to, to summatively, right? It is essentially uh, a construct or it is essentially a claim that some folks advance, uh, some claim that it's hypothetical, others claiming that it's actual and still uh, say it's historical, but it's effectively an entity, okay? It is a, a de facto contract or a compact reached between either uh, in version A, uh, each and every individual citizens with one another. So that's what we call inter-citizen agreement or contract. Or version B, a contract between all of the citizens in the state and the state itself, but the state is, is not the government, okay? It's instead sort of like the collective, the body politic, or uh, given the variety or the diversity of versions out there, some combination or conglomerate, okay, of the citizens residing in a particular country. Now, the, this compact 
has been employed to justify not just the legitimacy of the state, but also to offer an understanding, I suppose, uh, originally, as this was intended to, as to why we have reasons, normative reasons to obey the law, and also normative reasons to pay taxes, to support the state and government institutions beyond just the incidental facts that, oh, doing so, I don't know, gets me perks or gets me into uh, the, the interactions and activities of civilized society, alternatively, because the law forces me to. So essentially the contract was invented as an explanation. And then obviously it, it manifested, it evolved and it gradually you know, evolved over the years and metamorphosized into the beast that had arguably started out uh, seeking to constrain, i.e. a justification for an overbearing and oversubstantial state. With all that said, though, I don't think we need to go through the names of the philosophers who came with these contracts, because there's no point absolutely uh, whatsoever in quoting these names in speeches. It only makes you look like a doofus, uh, which, you know, for speaking from first hand experience, uh, indeed, is a bit of a problem. But uh, what I would say is think of social contract theories as disaggregatable into three main kinds, okay? The first is what we call an interest based conception. The second is a rights-based conception of the social contract. And the third still is a more organic, uh, direct slash body politic conception of the social contract. And some of these schools have had more folks okay, under the umbrella there, right? So, so say Rousseau uh, with regards to body politic or Hobbes with regards to interest, but also David Gauthier recently, but none of that matters. What matters though is the substance of the argument on offer. And I'll just go through each and every one of them uh, briefly, so you can note them down. If you wanna find out more about these theories, you're more than welcome to. The first version of this contract is one, oh, yes, is that a, oh, that's a message in the chat. Yep, I can explain that later on, no problems at all, cool. So the first version was, is essentially the view that in hypothetical, okay, in a hypothetical kind of factual, without the state, without the government, men and women and, and folks in general lived in rather treacherous conditions. These, these are conditions where, because of an absence of trust, a fundamental absence of trust, but also because of need for survival and also ultimately the scarcity of resources that existed, there existed very few options for individuals to work apart from either being constantly at loggerheads of one another, warring with each other, or seeking to initiate short-term and arbitrary and unstable cooperative relations, okay? And some versions here under this first of a sub-school of thought would posit that this was historical fact, that this was historical reality, this was what happened 8,000 years ago. Other versions or other variants would say, okay, look, we're not dealing with historical kind of factuals here. We're just dealing with hypothetical, okay? This is hypothetical without the government. Now, in comes the government who comes in here to say, okay, y'all stop fighting, you know? Y'all got to work together. And indeed, if you deviate from the norm, you'll be punished. If you deviate from the norm, you will lose your entitlement to the protection by this entity uh, that I call the enforcing authority, all right? And gradually, uh, if this enforcing authority is to indeed have executive authority over the land, it must be able to issue laws, to issue demands, to coordinate actions, to ensure that you do not indeed undermine each other's livelihoods, survival and core interests. And this is important because effectively what we then see is the emergence of a collective, a collective that transcends beyond the individual or the individuals within a particular territory, but a being, a being that comprises individuals' wills and thoughts and also beliefs, but doesn't exactly reflect it. So it's not representative in that sense. And this being holds each and every citizen accountable for the actions through the guaranteeing of punishment of when deviance arises, but also of security and law when each and every citizen complies with the enforced order. So you can see a lot of words of coming through here, order, stability, uh, suspension of liberties. It's a collective entity, a collective entity beyond the individuals. And this is the first variant of the social contract that we might 
see in debates where effectively the state acts as both an upholder of the collective's interests and also survival and also the, the now, some folks have in the past, especially in sort of the Renaissance and uh, near modern era, noted that this conception of the state might be rather cynical as to what the world would look like in the absence of a unitary authority. Instead, others would say, you know, this, this is a pretty pessimistic and gloomy uh, conception of human nature, right? Surely we're not bound to destroy and kill each other. It's not the case that life must be nasty, short and British without the government. It just so happens that an upholder of rights and then comes there for the second variant or the second conception of the social compact that says, actually, the hypothetical kind of factual isn't necessarily one where life sucks, but it's just one where fundamentally you might collaborate, you might cooperate, you might like each other, uh, and you might indeed uh, join these short-term and medium-term term, uh, collaborative enterprises. But the trouble there is in order for you to sustainably uh, develop resources and develop the lands and also, I suppose, formulate or form the, the communities that give meanings to your own lives, what you need is someone that guarantees the respecting and upholding of your liberties. And that is why it is not interest or security, but instead rights, rights, that as we'll explain later on in a section two, uh, entitlements that you have vis-a-vis -vis others, claims over property, claims over you know, territorial goods, it is that that constitutes and makes up the stuff of civilized societies. And ergo, what we ought to think about here is the state is the primary actor that ensures that your rights are being protected and where the state fails to do so, we may have the right to revolution against the state. So where the state actively jeopardizes your property rights and also causes the undermining of cooperation and effective allocation of resources, a right to revolution uh, may indeed entail that you can stand up and resist the state in that sense. So the second school of thought is far more optimistic about you know, what the world could look like without the state. It is not necessarily the case that life sucks without the government. And through that, therefore, the authority and the justification of the state some say is more circumscribed and more constrained as compared with the first variant. Although I would personally say that it's, it's a bit like comparing apples to oranges, that both the you know, both variants operate in rather distinct empirical assumptions and conceptions about the world that to compare between them in terms of generosity or which one's more stringent seems a tad disingenuous and also vacuous in that sense. But that's a mere technical observation. Anyway, so that those are the two main strands or schools of thought. And indeed, you can look at sort of the, the contemporary reflection of that debate in what we call the contractarianism versus contractualism debate. But I'm not going to go into too much detail there. I'll just flag that if you're interested in discussions there, you might want to look up David Gauthier, so uh, G-A-U-T-H-I-E-R, and also uh, Scanlon, and Thomas Scanlon, S-C-A-N-L-O-N. -S -S I'll type it out, actually. So uh, just Gauthier and Scanlon, Ooh, whoops. And they have lots of interesting things to say on that front. Uh, and on top of that, of course, they're both very impressive moral philosophers and political theorists in own right. Okay, finally then, the third variant I wanna cover here concerns the body politic theory. And some of you might've heard of Rousseau um, and also Rousseau's uh, musings over the origins of the social contract. And Rousseau is a philosopher who was in many ways a romantic, but also a, a passionate optimist about a very specific kind of politics. In his opinion, fundamentally, uh, the way we engage in politics in contemporary, I don't know, USA, Europe, EU, UK today would have been in his eyes, a fundamental perversion of what democracy and also what politics is about. Because back in his days, the way he theorized and saw politics was you and I and all of us in a particular country. So it's a defined policy, okay? It's not a, a random territory. Uh, but although some would say that his views of citizenship are fused with distinctively territorial lenses, that's an aside. 
I say is within a body politic or within a political collective that has a life of its own, Maxwell, so going back to your question, life of its own, that takes on preferences and needs and interests, that formulates its own wills as a collective, but that is not merely an aggregation, okay? Not merely the aggregation of the preferences and desires of each and every one of its members, but for a body politic to be rightly formed, and if it were rightly formed, it would also be attached with certain rights and obligations associated with being members of that, because that is a reflection of the general will of that body politic, of that collective, as opposed to the aggregative will. So a bit of a distinction here, right? An aggregative will of a collective is basically when you add all of the wills and desires and preferences of the people there together and take the majority. So for instance, uh, say there are 10 people in this room, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and five folks like apples and five folks like oranges, then an aggregated will or the, the accumulated will, okay, of that, that the 10 folks in the room would broadly point to a stalemate between apples and oranges because they have different preferences. Whereas to Rousseau, in the eyes of Rousseau, the general will of the population is one that is organic. So he starts with an analogy of addition and subtraction, right? He says, ah, it's about adding and subtracting, you know, plus and minus. And then voila, after adding and minusing the different preferences and wills of people, we get a general will. So he starts off with that. And it does strike me as being quite far-fetched and removed from reality that, you know, I add and subtract wills. Like, how can you do that, right? Like, we're not your mathematical sums. It's not quick maths, right? Two plus two does not, uh, well, two plus two for most people does equal four, but it's not, that's not how you determine and rationalize calculations in democracies today. But then he does add further supplements, right? To his argument, he says, actually, what this means then is there must be well-formulated procedures, reasonable processes that allow people to consider, to deliberate, to consider, to reflect, and then collectively combined arrive at a decision that reflects not the majority, not the incidental sort of the largest numbers within that group, but the collective general will. And that is where the obligations, political obligations to obey the law and also moral obligations towards one another within that policy come from. All right. So these are the three schools and three, these are the three variants of the state and justifying the state. And I'll just add in one quick observation before moving on to explaining why uh, it should be obsolete, or at least citing social contract theories should be obsolete uh, in debates. Uh, the, the quick comment here is, you can use the reasoning offered here to justify many things, many, many more sort of conclusions beyond just political obligation. You can employ interest-based accounts to justify folks following Twitter regulations, for instance, or indeed, body politic to justify uh, why people should respect the decisions of uh, the, the world, no, sorry, the FIFA Council or the Olympics Board or the Commonwealth Games for, for another. But what I will say is in its current forms, at its purest forms rather, these arguments are best applied as opposed to cited. So it would suit you much better in 90% of debates, not to cite the theorists who coined the particular social contract variant, but instead to apply the reasoning and logic straight away and specifically to the context. Why? Because if you say, oh, think about the social contract here, your judges are likely to be just fundamentally uh, either offended or confused or amused in a way that doesn't do justice to the arguments you offer. Whereas if you say, let's think about the reciprocity here, or let's talk about a body politic here, or let's analyze where the rights and liberties come from here, then I think that sort of a foreshadowing and preview of arguments are more likely to draw the attention and also the crediting by judges. Now, obviously, uh, in an ideal world, all judges are uber fair and super sensible and able to track all the arguments rigorously and flow them effortlessly. But we don't live in an ideal world, remembering the is ought continuum. We live in a world that's more is than it ought to be, especially in terms of how judges process and engage with arguments that are beyond sort of uh, uh, the, the usual uh, theoretical level of complexity that they're familiar with, right? And that's why it's important to render your arguments more user-friendly 
do not say, I'm going to run the social contract argument because that won't get you very far. It'll get you as far as saying, there's going to be backlash to this motion. Great. Next. Okay. So that's point number one here. Any questions before I move on to, uh, I, I suppose, the, uh, the second and third points here under theorizing the state? Any interjections? No? Okay. Right. So I want to talk a bit more then about deontological or deontic versus teleological, teleological accounts of the state. When justifying the state, I've explained those three theories and those three sort of variants. And you might notice that each and every one of these variants has both a consequence-driven dimension to it, especially, I suppose, the, the security one, and then also, uh, to a lesser extent, the general will one that talks about what the state ideally ought to do, the minimum provision, the minimum condition that the state ought to satisfy in order to be considered legitimate, right? It must deliver certain goods to the people, goods of stability, goods of security, goods of representation. But it's also a deontological facade or, or facet rather to the theories. And by deontological, I mean not to do with consequences, right? So, so uh, to do with reasons more precisely, rationality. And they come through in the forms of say, in the body politic case, the argument that you know, when, when each and every one within this body politic has given up uh, their own individual wills to be submitted, to be submitting to the collective general will, and that creates a sense of reciprocity that binds the collective together. That's a, de that's a deontological argument, right? Because the arguments from reciprocity uh, or the arguments from mutual coercion or the arguments from how you impact on one another within a policy, these aren't arguments that say the state is legitimate because it gives you things like X, Y, and Z. No, it's instead the state is legitimate because of the processes that constitute or form it that went through in order to comprise a state so the reasons we adhere to the law are, are far more to do with the deontological, to do with the reasoning, okay? To do with abstract, non-outcome focused conceptions of legitimacy. And indeed that's also something that's worth bearing in mind. If you want to justify a state, it's not the case that just because some state X brings about the best outcomes possible, that that state is therefore legitimate. I could bring about the best outcomes possible for a school as a patron who stipulates the building of, of sort of a, I don't know, a gym, a large gym where everyone's forced to exercise, okay? And the kids emerge from the exercise fitter, happier and bouncy and all that, that might be good for them and might be objectively justified even, or at the very least, you know, consequentially desirable, but that doesn't render the act legitimate. So this harks, or ec harks back to or echoes point four here, right? That some actions might be justifiable in terms of bringing about better consequences better outcomes overall, but it might not be illegitimate because what is lacking here is distinctively the authorization, the individual citizens authorizing the state, authorizing the political entity to make these decisions on their behalf. I did not get voted in or voted for by the school's population in order to bring about or to instantiate all of these changes to, to force them to attend PE. And yeah, that's a great question. So is a state legitimate if it just accomplishes some of those obligations? Uh, that's a great question, right? Because fundamentally what I want to say here is legitimacy and the way we understand legitimacy should be tied to authorization. An entity X is legitimate if uh, for to exert authority over Y, Z, and Alpha, if Y, Z, and Alpha authorize its uh, authority in that sense. And what is authorization? Well, authorization has both deontological and teleological components, right? So teleologically, a state that doesn't fulfill the minimum functions of a state, that doesn't deliver on the basic goods like stability, guaranteed expectations, a moral order or moral fabric within society, or indeed just upholding property rights is unlikely to fulfill the teleological or the consequence driven side and measurement of authorization there. But there's also a deontic element to it, i.e. do people consent to the state do people fundamentally want the state to exist? Do they say, I, I want the state to exist. I, 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 yeah, I like this government. I voted for it, okay? Did I, did I say that? Do I think that? Do I act in a way that renders that effectively, you know, what, what's going on here? 
And it is precisely for that, that authorization is not just about the answering or fulfilling of so-called objective goods and outcomes pertaining to that, but also subjective authorization, subjective agreement and consent from the people. So when we go back to, to the question of deontological versus teleological accounts of the state, what you really want there is from a state, not just the satisfying of some objective demands and criteria, but also to some extent, reasons-based or processual, okay, process-based authorization and empowerment of its operations. And all of this is another way of saying the reason why social contract theory should be obsolete is because the way it's run in most debates suggests a fundamentally misinformed or naive conception of the world. Because I think either you see people say, ooh, you never signed this contract, so you therefore never consented to the state. And the other side goes like, uh, 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 that's true, but you but, but, but you vote. And then a judge goes like, I don't know what's going on. One side says you didn't sign a contract. The other side says you vote. What, what's the pertinence to contract theory here? And the underlying issue there, by the way, in that scenario, is folks conflate social contract theory with consent theory. And of course, it's trivially true that you and I don't, you know, we don't come into the the world and we're not born into families having signed, I consent to being born in this city, or I consent to being a British citizen or a Spanish citizen or EU citizen, uh, which no longer applies to Britain anymore, uh, I suppose, um, after the 1st of January, right? So, so effectively, right, if you run social contract art theory and conflate it with uh, consent theory, A, that's a pretty botched way of running things, but B, you also attract very simplistic responses then, like you never signed a contract. And the second reason why is of understanding, I, I guess, where the state comes from and all of these facets of the state should, should make us hesitate about using social contract theory as a term in debate land is because in practice, there are many senses of the contract uh, or many ways in which the contract isn't really a contract that you can invoke, in which you may as well, you may as well run directly the justificatory basis for the arguments there, right? So if one variant of this is tacit consent. Tacit consent being what John Locke said, right? Ah, if I uh, walk on the roads, so if I enjoy public infrastructure, if I benefit from national security defenses and spendings by the government, I tacitly consent to the state. I tacitly consent as in I, I agree, I accept that I must take on responsibilities, political obligations, blah, blah, blah. And that's the argument as he presented. And, and you know, fundamentally, <clears throat> I've no qualms with the not normative prescriptions there. I've no qualms with what he then says. But what I do have qualms with is I don't think it's a tacit, I don't think it's a consent argument, right? To say that it's consent is akin to saying that the students consented to being forced to go to PE because they are, uh, some of them are obese and some of them are unhealthy and therefore they would benefit from the exercise they receive. No, right, that, that's not how consent works. And, and that's why fundamentally knowing that the state is legitimate or its legitimacy hangs on the hats of more than just objective outcomes and what happens is very important because it highlights that the notion of tacit consent or social contract, blah, 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 itself without further qualification and explanation, a lot more explanation and caveating in a context of debate is unlikely to come across as particularly persuasive. We can sit here and talk about the differences between tacit consent and hypothetical consent and author retrospective consent all day long, but in debate land and also in debate speak, it just doesn't come across as particularly persuasive. So you may as well omit that and jump straight to sort of normative substance and a bow up, right, of justifying the state there without invoking the terminology of the contract there. That's not to say the underlying reasoning I talked about just then is not relevant. It's just to say, be careful when you run arguments of that sort, and especially when your judges are unlikely to be amenable to the nuances and subtleties that you're providing in the claims there. Finally, just very quickly before we move on, what exactly are the criteria for a state and what should we care about from a state? So I think I've touched upon sort of what we ought to care about from a state uh, by going through the different contract theories. So let's just focus on the first question here. What is a state? And I don't want to follow this up with other than its people, because that's a, that's a joke that's quite funny, but I don't think uh, the most of you would get it. It's, it's, very, it's a dated reference. Anyway, what exactly is the state? <laughs> 
or a state, any state. I think it's a great joke, yeah. So uh, any thoughts, folks? What, what's a state? What isn't a state? Um, is, is your debating club a state, for instance? Is, okay, nope. What? Okay, all right. Uh, then I guess I'll answer my own uh, non-rhetorical question. So, I don't think there are any hard and fast criteria that can explain or account for all states, okay? So sorry to be a downer there. But I reckon a state or an entity that can be analogized yeah, yeah, okay, so that's a legitimate state, yeah. But I guess more generally, you can talk about sort of an entity with power, a monopoly of violence. Thank you for that, Bob. Good, and I think we'll just build on Bob and Maxwell's definitions there as well as good starting points. But I reckon uh, instead of thinking of a state as like, this is a state, this is not a state, and let's look at the encyclopedic definition of the state, which, which is a pretty 20th century way of talking about geopolitics and political theory. I think we should take a step back and just do some soul searching and I, I suppose navel gazing if you're interested in that, even though I don't think uh, I can gaze at my own navel. Anyway, uh, fundamentally, when we're talking about a state, we might say, is Facebook a state? Is uh, my local debate club or my local church a state? Or if it's not a state, are there certain reasons that render Facebook more comparable analogous with a state than my local church? And if so, what is it? And I think the devil lies always in the details. It lies in the extent of influence wielded by Facebook. It lies in the fact that states in general have a territoriality or territory aiming and centered aspect to it, right? That's associated with its search and desire to wield authority over a plot of land and defined territory. It's also to do with the, the, the fact that claims or asserts authority to govern, to arbitrate, to judge, to adjudicate. So Facebook or Twitter claims to be able to adjudicate freedom of speech disputes, which as we can see recently or from recent affairs is a controversial claim. Uh, and alternatively, uh, we, we might see para-governmental institutions or international intergovernmental institutions and organizations like WHO and, and also the UN who, who are not states, right? They're not states and countries in that sense, but they certainly act as if they were in a state in that sense. And the alternative to state or an alternative to, I suppose, any state rather, might be a stateless world, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's an orderless world, right? Because just because you don't have that entity that wields ultimate power over all of you doesn't mean that it's chaos. Maybe folks live happily ever after in anarchist communes. Maybe some folks indeed succeed in you know, having a stateless world or a stateless country or a stateless nation because they're so spread out and dispersed. Who knows? But the ultimate criteria for a state tend to revolve around three aspects. One, Emphasis upon territory and affinity for or with a particular plot of land. Secondly, executive authority. So not just executive authority, not just authority per se, like you know, the authority of a scientific expert who to comment on global warming or someone who talks about public health and managing the epidemic, but executive authority to arbitrate, to judge, to adjudicate, etc. Claims and competing conceptions of the laws, etc. And thirdly, and ultimately a monopoly of violence. And when we think of it as such, and when we recognize that you can have violence in more ways than one, not just physical violence, then lots of the entities that float about in life, we might not see as a state or state-like entity, we might also start conceptualizing now as states or parastates or quasi-states. For instance, Amazon or Foxconn, or indeed, uh, uh, SpaceX and what SpaceX is doing vis-a-vis -vis st space conquest. They're not governments, that's for sure. They don't claim to be political organizations, but they operate and act like states. And therefore I suggest that when we debate about that, we should also think about the political 
and the, the state associated aspects of their interactions with civil society and people at large. And very quickly then, because I think we're running out of time in this particular section, fundamentally the state, to recap, is an upholder of rights, is an arbitrator of disputes over interests, and also critical, according to some versions of the state, in maintaining the overarching stability of expectations, okay, of order, of norms that constitute and make up the moral fabric. And that's a more Confucian account of authority and political legitimacy kick in. I wish I had time to spend, to, to just expand upon that, but we sadly don't. What I will recommend, though, is that you check out uh, the, the works of a friend of mine and a, and a good friend and mentor of mine called Joseph Chad, who sought to combine Confucian philosophy with modern theories of democracy and accounting for political legitimacy. He's a great chap and, and uh, someone who's done a lot of great work at that front. So I was just uh, putting his name there. Anyhow, so very quickly, we've therefore touched upon what the state's limits are, what the state's justification is, what the state is and where we should see states and entities even where there's no government involved. All right, an application. Now, were, did, well, were we to have more time, I would uh, you know, break or, or uh, set up breakout rooms for us to, to dabble in and also to, to discuss these motions. But just very quickly then, I think we have time to talk about or talk through one of these motions and to see how it interacts with our conceptions and our discussion of the state just then. So why don't we just go for the nicest one and the most interesting one, in my opinion. This has would allow mutually consenting individuals to opt out of the state and form their own communities slash governments. Maybe we'll just go with the communities edit of this version. All right. So I'm going to ask a few guiding questions and then encourage you all to uh, contribute and pitch in. The guiding questions are firstly, what exactly, you know, is relationship between these mutually consenting opting out folks or folks who are opting out and the original state that they inhabit. What's the relationship like? Secondly, does unilateral sort of secession or unilateral withdrawal from the state equate a legitimate withdrawal from the state? And the flip side to that, of course, is without explicit consent, can the state still be legitimate? Or must these folks still obey the laws, okay, and abide by the laws that, that supposedly govern them and also the compatriots. Third question, are the new communities they form more legitimate, less legitimate, as compared with the original entities of which they're a part? Question mark. So with all of these guiding questions, uh, just want to see what exactly uh, do we think and where do we stand on this motion. So any thoughts from folks? Any thoughts? Anyone who hasn't spoken yet, um, keen to pitch in? I do enjoy running this as a sort of tutorial uh, slash seminar because it does uh, does replicate what I do for a living. So uh, great stuff there. Did they choose your government issue followers? Rightio. Okay. So um, Isa, could you, if you could, could you explain that point? Um, yes. If they justly, like if the elections were right and they gave their vote, that means that in some way they are giving the legit legitimacy to the government because they were the one to choose the ones that are making the laws right now. So if they chose the people that are making laws, then they should also accept the laws that they are making, even if, if they may disagree with them. Right, so they you believe that they should follow the laws or abide by the laws of the new community, right, or a new government, yeah? Yes, and at the same time, if there must be consent by the people, for the government to be um, like legitimate, it may also be for opposition true that if people don't agree with what the government is doing, yeah. then they have a word Good. on it. Good. So uh, I, either way, your account there sort of leans very heavily on consent and that's absolutely fair. I guess what I'll throw in there to discussion though is, suppose you're someone who has broken the law 
you violated a law in a particular country and the law is one that prescribes against theft. You stole bread and also a hundred pounds from someone and, and in order to feed your sister's child and also your sister. And then uh, the law decides to go after you and you say, I'm gonna opt out. I'm gonna opt out of the state and form my own communities. Do you think there's anything wrong with me saying, okay, because I now opt out of the state, I'm no longer bound by your laws. Uh, obviously, for those of you who are, are clued in, you'd recognize that this is a reference to a Valjean. <laughs> okay, never mind. I think that was a too subtle a reference. Yes, yeah, so, so good. But but I would note, Bob, just because we don't consent to being born doesn't mean that consent doesn't matter. It just means that, you know, if anything, right, because we're born already on a wrong footing without the ability to opt out of being born, we should all the more value consent where consent can be granted and respected. Right, exactly. So, Isaac, you talked about private relationships. Can you expand upon that a bit more? Because... Because obviously, by definition, if you opt out of the state, it's a public declamation, right? It's a public renouncing of authority, so to speak. Uh, Isaac? Yep, all good, okay. Yeah, so the upshot here is, um, so Isaac raised a fair point concerning sort of private relationships, though. but I, I would just caution against this private public cut for two reasons. One, if you opt out and form your own communities, that presumably applies to public domain and realm and activities within that. And secondly, you might also undercut important private obligations that the state might have some business, not, not ultimate, but some business in regulating. So, for instance, if you opt out of a state that requires you to pay a certain amount um, as the, the sort of uh, the, the payment, the settlement allowance, okay, in divorce cases, and you say, I don't like the state, I'm going to opt out of it unilaterally. Why? Because I don't want to pay money to the alimony to, to uh, my, my ex-wife or my ex-husband, and therefore I'm going to opt out of the state. That, that seems to be a private matter, right? It's a settled within civil court and civil law as opposed to criminal law. But concurrently, that opting out is itself immoral because it suggests that you're renouncing existing moral obligations and saying or using your absence of consent to political authority as an excuse, as an excuse to, to basically skirt responsibility at large there. And that ties us very nicely to both the conclusion of this section and also to the second question I want to ask today on rights. And how we are to make sense of rights, or if you will, wongs as well. Sorry, that was a joke, never mind, terrible joke. Right, so on rights, what exactly are rights? So I've written down a word entitlement here, but obviously it, it, right, right does not equal entitlement. That's a pretty reductionist and oversimplistic way of looking at things. The, the actual definition of rights, uh, in my opinion, is, it essentially is a form of a claim-like statement that A, guarantees, morally speaking, the validity of particular propositions, and B, that binds some other agent, including yourself possibly within that domain, in achieving or in obtaining that particular proposition. So human rights, for instance, are bundles of rights that describe or, or feature propositions like uh, that Bob or Sam or Annie uh, or, or, or Kathy or all human beings must have food and water 24 seven. That's a proposition, P. And you can see all the conditional qualifiers and all of that, like 24 seven, blah, 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 blah. And then as a subsidiary to that, the expectation here is that this is something that is obtained and guaranteed by either state. So if you start with a more sort of state-centered conceptions of human rights law, the state or the courts. And then if you progress from that to more expanded conception of it, everyone, right? Hence the discussion about you 
having a responsibility to protect as individual citizens, not just as members of state, so to speak, in cases of human rights violations. But that's essentially what I would say, right, can be conceptualized or, or, or defined as. And I wanna highlight two features here. When we talk about rights, A, we often neglect, but we cannot neglect the importance of the upholder and the enforcer of the rights and how the two of them are different. Upholders of rights are those that are actually necessary and unlocking the outcomes specified in the rights claims. Whereas the enforcers of the rights are those with second order authority and higher order authority to mandate that these outcomes are accomplished. So case in point, in the context of uh, employment law, for instance, the employee of a particular firm is entitled to, let's just say uh, 35 um, Hong Kong dollars per hour as minimum wage, right? Even though it's 37.5, as far as I'm aware now for 2021. Anyway, so that's a minimum wage and that's the entitlement. The employer must uphold the rights of the employees by paying the employees a minimum wage. But the enforcer is a government, is a state in this case. Uh, another example being in the classroom, for instance, students have rights to learn, okay? Not necessarily learn uber well, but at least be provided with information and support and aid to some extent. Teachers are the upholders of the rights. And the enforcers include the school authorities, the school board, and those who inspect upon or look, uh, look, look at the behaviors of or the performances of teachers. What would you say are more? Im okay, that. <laughs> right, okay, that, that was a great, great question from Maxwell. He said, uh, which are more important, rights or lefts? Uh, and I would say, uh, well, you, you can't be right in a. Uh, both cases, so I would go with the right answer. Okay, so what exactly are rights? Uh, I've touched upon that. Yeah, so broadly speaking, you know, that's how I think rights ought to be looked at. And the second comment I'll make there is rights reflect or correlate with propositions. And these propositions are the end states, right? That everyone receives food and water, shelter. That everyone is capable of... Uh, to some extent or another, uh, maybe the right to be forgotten. I don't know. The, these are the idealized end states though, right? Like to be forgotten completely where you wish to be or wish to have your, your histories erased or alternatively that you eliminate world poverty and hunger. The, these are the idealized end outcomes. And, and what we usually hear, by the way, is, is in debates about rights, you have one side saying these are rights and the other side says, ah, but these rights, it, it, it just, it, it's infeasible. You can't have them. It's impossible. Eliminating world poverty is impossible. Therefore, you have no rights against poverty, uh, against uh, your being in poverty. So the structure of the dialectic here is one side says there's a right, the other side says that's not feasible. Here I must weigh in and say, look, let's be very careful here about what we're talking about here when it comes to feasibility. Because obviously there are certain sort of claims or propositions that are clearly infeasible today in 2021, such as that everyone lives to 170 and no less, okay? At least 170 years as one's lifespan. Now that's infeasible because given contemporary technology, we can only live to around 100 or 80 to 100. So it's infeasible in that sense. And it does sound rather absurd to say, I have a human right to live beyond 170. But what about 30? Should we have a human right to live beyond 30? I, I think that's something that's both easily feasible and probably, you know, on balance, something that we're willing to entertain, if not endorse. The trouble, though, kicks in when it's when we're looking at, say, 90. Do we have a human right to live until 90? Can we sue someone or hold someone accountable for their own citizens' denizens if they fail to live to 90 years old? What about 60? What about 70? What about 50? As we can see, as with is ought as a continuum, the lifespan or the expect, expected lifespan that people have also exists on a continuum. Given particular circumstances and conditions and technological feasibilities and constraints along those lines, we might say 170 is clearly beyond the realm of the possible and therefore the right, that any and all rights claims centered around that would be absurd. But 30, 20, 10, 
doesn't seem all that absurd. Especially when you add in the qualifiers like uh, you know, permitting or, or, or granting that you, you're, you're broadly speaking a healthy individual, right? So you, that your, your major reasons of death are to do with, I don't know, murder or crimes or being mucked and all that. Or alternatively, diseases that really ought to be eliminated by now, folks just bothered with spending more money into that instead of naming the children after a planet. Then if that were the case, just because it seems on, on surface infeasible, doesn't render that demand unreasonable. And it is reasonableness as opposed to feasibility at simpliciter that I think rights claims ought to track. So if you're in a debate and someone says, I think I have a human right, okay, what's your human right? I think uh, I have a human right, or this act has a human right to uh, not being offended. <laughs> then we must ask ourselves not, not the question of, is it possible to not be offended? But instead, is it reasonable to expect that one is not offended at all? Noting, of course, that people who, who construe others as making arguments along these lines are often strawmanning, right? The arguments in favor of measures like no platforming or indeed safe spaces. And indeed, I don't think offense plays that much of a role in these debates, if at all. I, I indeed don't think offence is at all a persuasive account of anything or justification of anything to do with the, the campus culture and free speech debate. But taking a step back then, just because something may not be a fe feasible, you know, given the, the harsh realities that we inhabit, doesn't render it out of reach, morally speaking, because we might say the reality sucks and it's up to the government and up to the actors which what we're here to change it. They can't shirk responsibility saying life sucks, ergo, you know, life goes on, right? Just because war is happening, just because there's famine, pain, pestilence and suffering doesn't render it just. So if one side says, I think everyone has a right to uh, equal political representation and, us, and the other side says, yeah, but that's not gonna happen. So we don't have these rights. Then that doesn't deal with the argument. But in contrast, if you talk about everyone has a right to political representation on one hand and the other side says, right, but in achieving so, you are effectively risking an X, Y, and Z and making huge assumptions concerning political realities and also how political psychology and feasibility constraints operate. Then we can talk about whether or not this right is absolute and indeed warranted and justified. Because maybe then, in that case, it's still an important right, but it's easily outweighed by counter considerations pertaining to consequences or outcomes or feasibility constraints, blah, blah. So rather than asking, is this right feasible to obtain? We should instead ask, is it reasonable to expect that this right be discharged, this right be fulfilled and satisfied? In that sense, not be discharged. Discharge applies to obligation, fulfillment applies to rights. There we go. So that's just a quick sort of survey of rights, and I suppose some nuancing there. Then I want to ask the questions. What exactly are the kinds of rights, or how can we classify rights, okay? And I suppose we can start with the negative and positive liberty dichotomy, although to be entirely honest with you, I'm not particularly passionate or keen on talking about it. I, I might just refer you to Berlin. Sorry, he was uh, a fellow at, uh, at Wolfson College as well uh, at Oxford, uh, my, my college, uh, Isaiah Berlin, uh, who, who broadly speaking spoke of and discussed uh, the differences between positive liberty and negative liberty. And I don't want to go into too much detail there because I think you can certainly read up on this. But I will say is his typology essentially argues that we can classify rights based upon sort of the following dichotomy, okay? In the case of a negative conception of rights, people have the right against interference, against external action, against tampering or transformations to their own bodies, to their own interests. So basically a negative... Uh, right to a negative liberty read as a defensive claim is to say i don't want others to exerting force or coercion or any and all forms of interference with my life whereas a positive claim or a positive liberty is is an argument that you are entitled to or that you deserve effectively and you essentially have the, the moral grounds okay for exercising particular liberties of yours to do with your fulfillment and the enrichment of yourself. So I have a positive liberty to start a career to self-realize or to use commonplace debate lingo, uh, self-actualize. 
Whereas I have a negative liberty from maiming, from killing, from death. But it's worth noting, whilst negative and positive have often been talked about in opposition to each other, fundamentally it is possible to analyze them in a combined and collapsed framework, right? Because by definition, if I have a positive liberty to do something, like a positive liberty to deliver this workshop, it's because I also have a negative liberty or a negative claim commensurate with this. That means that I have a claim against any other folks sabotaging my workshop sessions by stopping my screen sharing and launching their own presentations alongside and forcing me to listen to it. So by definition, as McCallum analyzes or outlines in his response to Berlin, we have both a positive and negative component associated with most of our liberties out there. My positive liberty to lead a happy life, my positive liberty to apply and get into a job without discrimination. If I were to meet the conditions or the minimum conditions stipulated by the job description, are also accompanied by my negative liberty against folks uh, preventing me from going to work. So rather than seeing this typology as a hard and fast dichotomy, okay, boom, 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 either it's negative or positive, think of it as two sides of the same mountain. Think of it as a north side and the south side of Mount Everest. The north face and the south faces of, uh, yeah, you get it, mountains out there, all right, okay. I don't want to spend too much time on that though. I want to spend more time on liberty versus claim rights because I don't think that's something that most whole theory or philosophy lets you hear uh, talk about. So what, if anything, are liberty or claim rights? So there's a jurist called Huffeld, um, H-O-H-F-E-L-D, and he basically says, look guys, this, this simplistic conception of rights that we have, and, he, and mind you, this was sort of the early 20th century, so he's pretty... He was a pioneer of his times. The simplistic understanding of rights as, as entitlement or as sort of legal claims and propositions is too reductionist. Let's instead you know, break rights down to at the very least two broad families. And here, this is effectively a more dichotomous than the negative uh, positive typology I had, a more dichotomous classification and conception of rights. So, what are liberty rights and what are claim rights? Claim rights operate as follows. A claim, so uh, for instance, uh, let's start with, ooh, what is going on? I hate technological glitches. I wish I had a claim right against tech failure. X has a claim over Y that uh, omega, I, I don't know how to type the symbol omega, so I'll just type omega. If, It is the case that omega should be true and y should facilitate omega. Now, there's some dispute over where or not, uh, you know, y should accomplish, bring about, uh, realize variants of that. So I'm just going to group all of them under the terminology of facilitation because that's fine. Or indeed, if you're looking for layman terminology, bring about, okay, bring about Omega. So I have a claim right over um, my the bookshop owner that uh, my, that Nussbaum's latest book is delivered to my house. If it is the case that Nussbaum's latest book should be delivered to my house, should be true, and the bookshop owner or the bookshop should facilitate that. Okay, so claim right is essentially like, as intuitively, eponymously, you know, a claim over others that particular outcomes are obtained. Whereas a liberty right in general is weaker. So X has a liberty, okay, right to omega. If X has no duty, to not omega. <clears throat> so I have a liberty right to, what do I have a liberty right to do? I guess I have a liberty right to purchase four coffees of latte or four cups of lattes and to drink them all and finish them all in an afternoon because I have no duty to, to not drink lattes and four cups of them. I really like latte. Uh, 
for our liberty right to consume a sparkling tea because I know if I have no duty to not consume sparkling tea. A liberty right is usually seen as a weaker claim than claim right because of two reasons. One, claim right is to some extent pegged with or pegged to success and the realizing of that outcome, omega, right? To bring about omega. And secondly, claim rights tend to extend to justifying, you know, your claims over others beyond yourselves, whereas liberty rights only explain the moral agency and account for the moral agency and the actions of yourself as an individual. And we're gonna see this typology in action when we analyze uh, the World 2016 Finals. So a bit of a straw poll here. And uh, I guess this is a funner part, sort of funner bit uh, of today's lecture. If you believe that OG won the uh, World's Thessaloniki final, please type OG in the chat. If you think CO won, please type CO into the chat. If you think CG won, because um, I know someone definitely thinks CG won, <laughs> I won't name the person, please type CG. And if you think that OO won, please type OO. Um. <laughs> Okay, interesting. Three CO so far. Four CO is okay. Wow. Hot House really has fans here. Wonderful. Yeah, I, I also thought CO in, a, in another out round at Worlds probably went through. But anyway, I'm sorry, that was a joke. Um, <laughs> just bitter. Okay, any OG fans? Anyone? Okay, all right then, everyone thinks C Okay, Maxwell thinks OG, that's... Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Oh, that's great. Okay, very kind of you. Okay, cool. So, all right, L let's analyze the claims. Um, and I like to raise this as an example of liberty claim trade-off here. Let let's analyze the claims in that round. So let's start with OG. OG said a lot of things. And one of the claims, I suppose, especially evidenced by Bosio's sort of rhetoric, but I think was, was more clearly specified and concretized in a finale speech, is essentially the argument that uh, the, the communities that are talking about, I'm just going to insert C in short, as an abbreviation for the communities, workers, blah, blah, blah. That communities possesses the liberty right to attempt a Marxist revolution, whatever you call it, the global poor shackled under uh, structures of no alternatives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we'll, we'll shorten that to P. And recognize here that the argument or the way they justified it, and the reason why I think it's fair to read it as liberty right comes from two subclaims. The first is essentially that they have been oppressed, or rather that C has been, have been oppressed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And secondly, that C has the right to self-defense. And note, you're having the right to self-defense basically translates to that uh, any actor, say C star, has the right to defend C star against external threat, which is in turn interchangeable with C star as no obligation to not defend C star against an external threat. And a corollary of that, by the way, uh, or rather, okay, instead of saying corollary, I'm going to say an alternative or supplementary thesis under that is that that C, whoops, has the right to try to defend themselves, right? You have the right to sit an exam. You're not entitled to getting 100% or A star or seven if you do the IB or, or distinction or first class honors, but you have, the, you have the right to try. You have the right to try to defend themselves, okay? As a community. Uh, this is not pegged. It is not pegged to the outcome of successful defense or successful self-defense or whatever you call it. So the actual argument here is that 
that C is uh, falls under the domain of self-defense claims or something like that. CO's rejoinder can be interpreted in two ways. The first claim is that you will fail. And the second, which I think is a claim that needed just a tad more warranting and weighing and spelling out in order to stick against OG. And maybe depending on your, your own gut instinct and intuitions about judging where you might probably spread it as more persuasive than OG, is that you will hurt others. The C will not succeed at P. And C will uh, D, okay? And D is bad. The example being, uh, you'll fail. These are the barriers, these are the constraints. These are the additional harms you might accrue in a process. The reason why that final has caused such split reactions is I think some folks believe that these two theses, A, were quite well warranted, and B, would sufficiently defeat the argument concerning liberty right. So the fact that C will not succeed at P is at least efficient and only eliminate or to undermine the credibility of the, the trying claim, the claim about trying, and by extension, the liberty rights argument, or the right to attempt P. I'll note here, of course, that I don't think the liberty right to P equates the right to attempt P. These are different things, but the way OG ran the argument means, I think, it's a liberty right, as opposed to a claim right interpretation that does what they said, justice. So with that said, some others on a panel, when indeed in general, would think, no, right? These do not interact sufficiently with a claim and do not defeat it. Where lies the dispute? I think fundamental ambiguity lies with, do we think the fact that C will not succeed at P adequately answers to, you know, both, or at least one of, or the most promising and more prominent one of the right to try, and also no obligation to not do so. Some might say it does, because, hey, you know, what's the point in trying when you're clearly going to fail? When you try so hard and you don't succeed, as Coldplay once said, I'm going to fix you, right? Whereas others would say, just because you try doesn't mean you're gonna die, right? As Pink once said, and that's where you would argue that plausibly speaking, you have the right to attempt it, even if that attempt doesn't necessarily go through. And the second ambiguity is to what extent does C will D outweigh possesses liberty right to P? Because the argument here is C has no obligation not defend, but if I can prove that C has an obligation to avoid D and D is bad and D follows from the motion P, like that and P, then very clearly C does have an obligation to not uh, defend themselves against an external threat, or at least in a way that OG stipulates. So that's where I think the liberty and the claim and also the attempt versus fulfillment sort of uh, like comparisons and dichotomies are most useful in allowing us to make sense of what's going on or what went on on that fateful night, uh, that freezing fateful night in Thessaloniki. Uh, it was really, really cold. That's all I remember from Freak Worlds. It was very cold um, and it was also winter. Anyway, so that's essentially how we can apply rights analysis in making sense of claims about what we ought to do, what we ought not to do, et cetera, et cetera, in debate land. Now, very quickly, I'm just going to go over the last few slides um, in, in terms of the additional topics you might be interested in exploring. Don't worry if you've missed out on any of this. I'll upload the slides. The, the website as well. But beyond talking about rights and estates, I, I think there are also various other questions you might want to look into in terms of political and moral status at the margins, okay? So basically, do entities on the margins here possess rights? And of course, when it comes to animal rights, uh, Peter Singer is an obvious sort of candidate. Another one being Jeff McMahon, uh, where he talks about literally ethics at the margins of life and also killing. <laughs> These authors that you can check out, not not examples of animals. Okay, Peter Singer. Okay, actually, no, they 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 are animals, but they're not. Anyway, whatever, it, it's fine. You get the point. So, these are authors that you might want to read and, and sort of check out, I suppose, for more information. Peter Singer's Animal Liberation remains one of my favourite contemporary moral philosophy texts, uh, not because of how advanced it is, because of how fundamentally 
you know, politically important it is as a public facing piece of work. And then on the political status and the moral status of children, uh, the works of uh, Brighouse and Swift, and also Anka, gosh, I think I'm spelling Anka's name right. I apologize if I'm spelling it wrong are very interesting in terms of elucidating sort of where they stand politically and if we think children should be given the fullest roster of rights that are fundamentally associated with it. And the reason why we might not think so also has to do to some extent with what we think the criteria for political and moral rights are. And I wish I had more time to develop that because I, I swear I could actually go through uh, these topics uh, using uh, no, no fewer than one hour or 60 minutes. But anyway, infants. What's the moral status of infants? How are we to make sense of infants and, and newborns, you know, for instance, or individuals who are dead in terms of posthumous rights? And that's where the works of uh, Cecile Fabra is quite interesting, for instance, in, in exploring where or not you can have rights, even if you no longer exist and are dead as an individual. And finally, the environment. Should the environment be granted political rights and liberties? And if so, who speaks the environment? Who has standing to speak on behalf of the environment? And here, you know, I would recommend a very interesting piece on the Lorax and standing of animals that was published on OPR, uh, the Oxford Political Review, a few months back by Oscar Shetty, uh, where he talks about the environment and legal rights and representation in that sense. So I'm sorry that we've run out of time. This is now, it's now bang on 10 o'clock where I am. Any questions or any, oh yes, and also reparations, uh, my, my favorite pet topic, okay. But uh, yeah, any questions in general and any thoughts? Because if not, I wanna say a few words to thank, uh, of course, the wonderful efforts and work by uh, Madrid UDC 2021, and also just uh, amazing work, you know, that they're putting together, especially in light of the difficult circumstances we're in and gosh, Gosh, these circumstances are indeed difficult. So any questions at this point? All right then, uh, thank you all very much. Have a good evening. Goodbye. <laughs>